Thank you, Hazel. So good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar, Encouraging and Enabling Modal Shift Through Community Engagement. My name's Sarah Chilton, and I'm still, I think I can say, fairly newly appointed Head of Communications and Policy. Uh, I've been in post about three months now, so I'm still very much finding my feet, um, but really keen to get out to meet many of you, hopefully in the not too distant future, fingers crossed. So to begin with, I'm just going to run through a couple of practicalities, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So they're as much for me as they are for you in many ways. So the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on video uh, and the slides on our website um, later on today or tomorrow. Your camera is automatically switched off. Sadly, mine is not. So you get to look at me for now and your microphone will be muted. But if you do come to speak, a member of the team will turn on your uh, microphone automatically, but your camera will remain off. Please make use of the chat button for any comments or ideas as we're going through. And I know Hazel and Hannah will be monitoring that chat function. And, and if appropriate, we may ask you to join the debate um, whilst it's happening live. Um, so during the discussions, everyone will give, be given the chance to speak. So please do use the raised hand function at the bottom of your screen. I'm sure you're all familiar with that now. And if you do come to speak, do introduce yourself, you, your name and where you're from. And also if possible, try and keep your contributions just for around a minute. So we give as many people as possible time to contribute. If you have any technical issues whatsoever, please do not come to me because I'm a complete technophobe uh, and make use of the, the, the great Hannah Cottrell who will be able to help you out. If you text your name, um, I think her, her number is on the joining details. So you'll be able to, if you just drop her a quick text, hopefully she'll be able to help you out. At the end of the webinar, we will be doing a feedback survey. So please do contribute to that um, because that enables the team to refine uh, these webinars and learn from each one. But also, um, you know, they're going to be here probably for some time yet. So we, we want to build and get the best out of them. So as I say, I'm really pleased to be hosting today. So I'm going to get us underway with the support of Hannah um, and Hazel. So I think we have around about 50 um, potentially joining us today and, and they're coming through thick and fast. I think the webinar in many ways follows on from the previous webinar, which was the first webinar I attended, which was around promoting Rails Green credentials. So it's, like it's looking at the next steps in many ways. So how do we encourage, how do we enable that modal shift through community engagement? Um, and for me, community rail really excels at community engagement. It's at its very heart. It's the very essence of the movement. So I think we can play a really uh, crucial role in shifting those behaviours across the country. So our panellists are going to take us through a, a journey, so to speak. And I think there are sort of three outcomes that I'd hope people would get from it. And I include myself in that in terms of getting that greater awareness and understanding uh, of the picture around sustainable transport that deeper understanding of some of the key facts and future plans within the sector to prioritise decarbonisation and environmental sustainability. Um, and I think the real big one, and particularly for me, is around that increased confidence um, to work more closely with train operators and other partners to support, to support that wider activity and the messaging around green credentials and joining those dots in terms of how we can contribute to that wider debate. Um, we're really keen to hear your views Please don't let me have any awkward silences in those chat sessions. So really do contribute um, and make those comments. That would be um, really helpful. Um, so before we start, we're going to do a quick poll um, just to gauge where people are at the moment um, so that we can measure that when we, we come to do our feedback at the end. And it will also be good for me um, in terms of the role I've got to, to see where people are on that policy spectrum as well. So I think Hannah's going to launch the poll. So there it is. I love it when the technology works. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> uh, are speakers allowed to play? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, click panellists can uh, vote as well. Yep. <laughs> well, I hope your answer is very familiar, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> We're in trouble if it isn't, Richard. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm over familiar by nature. <laughs> Give it another few seconds. That's great. Hannah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 
Right, so that's a quite a, a, it's an interesting even mix there, really, across the across the board. Yeah, very interesting. So we'll compare that um, at the end of the session um, with our feedback through our feedback form. So now, without further ado, we're going to go to our first panelist, who's Richard uh, Walker, who is a visiting research fellow with Decarbonate, and that'll be followed by Jules Townsend, our very own chief executive of Community Rail Network. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Sarah. And hi, good morning, everyone. All right, I'm going to now share my screen. So here goes. And hopefully, um, someone will just have to uh, yes, ask, tell me if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. great. OK, so um, thanks ever so much to uh, Sarah and Jules and, and CRN for inviting me to speak uh, today. I, I said I'd pick up what we've called the bigger picture. And um, if you like the sort of why Community Rail should aim to uh, do something in this area. And then hopefully Jules and Paul speaking later will, will be more on the how. Um, but I'd like to get involved with that discussion as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to kick off with, with um, a few slides. Um, and I, I want to just go through what I do at Leeds University and, and what I do with South East Lancashire CRP, because I am a CRP volunteer. Um, then I wanted to pick up um, what, what I've called community rail and building back better from COVID-19. Um, you know, creating better places and healthier lifestyles. I then want to cover community rail and the what I call the transport decarbonisation challenge. And then uh, I'm going to turn to uh, community rail and, and mode shift. And I'm going to give you a few facts about leisure travel, which I think is uh, something we, we, we could uh, focus on. So um, just to explain what the mysterious decarbonate is. So I'm actually a Department for Transport Civil Servant. I work with local authorities in the north of England, uh, but I'm on secondment this year to the Institute for Transport Studies at Leeds University, where the, 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 who are running a um, project called Decarbonate, which is about decarbonizing uh, transport. And the N8 stands for the N8 Group of Northern Research Universities, which is uh, Leeds, York, Newcastle, Durham, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, and Lancaster. So, um, what there's lots of um, uh, activity, uh, but it's all basically about making the north of England an exemplar or a, um, a well known place for innovation in transport decarbonisation. And the bit that I'm working on is what we're calling. Uh, place-based decarbonisation of transport, which is about getting the right um, uh, instruments and the right uh, methods and, and things to do in the right places, because decarbonising transport varies according to what kind of place you're talking about. So um, that's that. I'm just going to mention another thing I'm working on. Um, so this is also being done um, out of ITS. It's called the COVID-19 Transport Travel and Social Adaptation Study. And this was put together quite quickly uh, uh, just over a year ago uh, due to the COVID uh, crisis. And um, it's basically uh, tracking about uh, 1,200 people and seeing what, how their transport use is changing throughout the, um, th throughout the pandemic. So the first set of surveys were um, um, during the first lockdown last year. And then there's a second set of surveys in October, and they're going to, because we, we, we ended up with more lockdowns than we expected, uh, there's going to be a third, fourth and fifth wave to, to track what happens uh, to the same people uh, and their transport behaviour as, as we kind of emerge from the, the, the COVID pandemic period. Uh, and my piece of that uh, big project is, is to do with uh, what's happening to city centres. And there's a picture of Leeds City Centre. If you if you've not if you don't recognise it, um, and what 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 are people who work in Leeds and people who bring uh, commercial property to the market in Leeds? How are they reacting to the pandemic? So that's what I do in my day job. Um, and then I just um, should also mention I do volunteer for uh, the South East Lancashire Community Rail Partnership and uh, Bolton Station Community Partnership. And we're uh, building a, or, or developing a community hub at Bolton Station. We hope to turn Bolton Station to Bolton's welcome to all. And when we come out of lockdown and we get launched, um, it will be a delight to invite everybody here to come to our 
opening party. So um, I, I just thought I just on the subject of building back better from COVID-19, I, I hopefully you've seen a lot of statistics from the rail industry about how rail um, you know, how rail patronage has been going since the pandemic. I've not got any slides on that today because I thought you might have seen them before. So I thought we'd just have a look from the other end of the telescope, if you like, which is what, you know, what people are reporting um, about what they're doing, how they're traveling. And this is, say, this is, um, it's, it's 1,200 people in this uh, uh, longitudinal survey. So before the pandemic, 76% um, of people didn't work from home at all. 20% uh, of people work from home some of the time, maybe say one day a week, and 4% of people um, uh, worked, com you know, completely worked from home. And that was the pre-pandemic scenario. And by October 2020, when we we're coming out of the first lockdown, but before we went into the second lockdown, uh, that had switched to 38% um, of people working from home the whole 100% of the time. And, and then the further 17% doing some of the time. So 44% of people have got the kind of jobs that you cannot do from home, but um, over half have. And um, the key thing is we don't expect, um, we don't expect the post pandemic, if, if, if there is such a phrase is appropriate, but we don't expect to go back to the pre pandemic proportions. We think working from home is here to stay, not in those amounts, but it's, it's here to stay. And that's got huge implications for um, the rail industry, for the bus industry, for uh, people whose job it is to manage the road network and people who it is who, who's, uh, you know, obviously commercial property, retail industry, everything. So that, that's, I'll, I'll put that on the table to look at. Um, here's another um, uh, um, uh, uh, result from, from the interviews. Uh, this is what mode of transport do you use at least three days a week? And um, you can see the blue bar is what before lockdown, the, the uh, orange bar is during lockdown and the gray bar is where, where we were at as at October of last year. And you can see that um, train use, uh, which of course, you know, most people, 95% of people don't use the train three days a week. Only 5% do, but that dropped right down and hadn't yet come back by October. It's still at 2%. Um, and the thing that had really um, gone up and shot up, and there was a kind of big news, was that walking, a lot more people were walking at least three days a week um, by October than they were before the lockdown. And we expect that that's probably going to persist. People are reporting that they, they like it and they want to carry on doing it. So it's actually 50% of people walk more than three days a week, which is a 50% increase on the pre-pandemic situation. And that, those, the fact that those two numbers are the same is just a coincidence. So um, what do I uh, conclude on uh, community rail and building back Becca from COVID-19? I mean, I mean, these are just thoughts, really. But it feels to me that as a movement, we ought to plug into the fact that people um, are reporting they they having a healthier lifestyle and they're enjoying a healthier lifestyle. I'm not talking about uh, COVID itself, but the, the lifestyle of, of, of working from home, walking more and, and things like that could be healthier and we should build on that. And m my own view is that we ought to take the opportunity to improve the, the quality of town and city living in, in, in this country. And uh, there's various slogans you can use, the new urban village, uh, the uh, the 15 minute cities are, are kind of a hot um, uh, term that's being used at the moment because the the, the French uh, Paris is 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 uh, developing its Ville du Cap de uh, system. So that's all your facilities um, within walkable distance of where you live. Um, and I would just call that really it's just re-establishing the traditional neighbourhood. Um, of most places, most towns and cities were walk, were built to be walkable, and we've just got to rediscover that. Uh, but an, another thing that I think is worth mentioning is that town and city centres have changed for good. I think in terms of people shopping online and things like this, those were changes that were, were expected to happen. And what the retail industry says that the the next uh, what was expected to happen in between five and 10 years during the 2020s has happened all, all at once in one year. 
And so the town, so the, what we call a clone town, you know, full of change stores, those will change, but that could be an opportunity to make a better town and city centres and we should take it. Um, the other factors that Community Rail as a movement should think about, th th there is a sort of mobility revolution going on. There are new modes. There's people buzzing past me on electric scooters at the moment. Um, there are new business models for mobility. That's things like shared uh, car clubs, shared use of, of um, electric bicycles, um, Uber, uh, various apps, mobility as a service. And, and we need to um, make sure that um, rail and community rail is an integral, integral part of uh, this kind of mobility as a service future. And I can talk further on that um, if people want to ask about it, but I'm going to move on now. Um, oh, sorry, yes, I forgot this slide. Uh, I, I did want to say that I, I do feel that Community Rail might have a particular role in the leisure travel or staycation area. And of course, this is a picture of uh, Scenic Rail Britain, which is uh, a website that's uh, run by C Community Rail Network. If you, if, I hope you all know it, but if you don't know it, I highly recommend it. Um, and this is a kind of a mechanism by which um, community rail partnerships can get involved in, 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 in um, promoting rail and sustainable travel for, for, for leisure and for staycations, of which there are going to be a hell of a lot this year. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that, that was uh, building back records after COVID. Now, I did want... I, I'm now going to turn to transport decarbonisation. Um, the big picture, I think everybody knows it and uh, nobody likes to say it because it's rather depressing thoughts, but it, it is, it, it, it's the big problem in the 21st century. It makes COVID seem like a relatively trivial affair, I'm afraid. Um, it's here to stay. Um, there's, you know, there's record breaking temperatures in California and across the whole West of the USA, in Siberia this year. And yet the, the kind of daunting thought is that this is gonna be the coolest summer uh, that we're gonna have for the rest of this century. There's not gonna be a cooler one than this any year now. Um, and yet, you know, we, we've got a lot of problems. So we, we, we are in trouble. And I just wanted to say that we're not exempt from it in this country, that picture of uh, fire is actually Saddleworth Moor in Greater Manchester in February of 2019. Uh, February when uh, it had not rained for the whole month, which is a very unusual February in the Pennines. And um, this is the kind of uh, weather that we're going to have to uh, deal with and uh, need to make sure the situation doesn't get too much worse. Um, and the big picture for transport decarbonisation is that we've got to think, and, and this isn't widely enough, uh, you know, it's not common currency widely enough. Um, I've got to think in terms of a carbon budget. So there is a fixed amount of fossil fuel we can still safely burn. And if we burn it now, we can't burn it later. So basically, because there are some things we're going to have to use fossil fuels for, we've got to stop using fossil fuels for, for things that we don't really need. And we've got to start cutting that now. We don't, we can't wait 10 years to get serious about emissions reduction because we'd actually use our entire carbon budget for the rest of the century or the rest of time in the next 10 years if we don't if we use it at the current rate so we we, we we've known that we need to cut carbon emissions for 30 years and in the transport sector we've done nothing about it uh, or not enough about it and so in the 2020s we really got to get our act together and there is, has been a policy response. Um, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll just very quickly whiz through these documents. There's a, um, the Department for Transport has its transport decarbonisation plan. Uh, it's not yet published. Um, it, it's, it's due to be published in the spring of 2021. So it's obviously been knocked back a bit by um, people being dragged off to deal with COVID, but it, it, that's... Um, a big deal that the Department of Transport is going to put decarbonising transport front and centre of its policy. The context for that is the Climate Change Commission's, um, who are the government, official government advisors, they set legally binding carbon budgets on, on the British government. And so that's uh, that was the, the sixth carbon budget, which, which covers the early 2030s, came out last December. And of course, there's international efforts as well. And you'll be aware of um, the uh, United Nations um, 
Climate Summit in Glasgow in November, which was postponed from 2020 to, to this year. And that's where a global agreement that all the countries are going to um, do their bit uh, will hopefully be thrashed out. Um, so just to um, open the, the, the cover of this uh, decarbonizing transport, the, 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 the Department of Transport sets six strategic priorities for decarbonizing transport. And I'll just pick out a couple of those. So accelerating the modal shift to public and active transport. So that's the thing. You've got to do something about behavior as well as decarbonizing road vehicles, decarbonizing fr freight, uh, coming up with um, uh, technological innovations in, 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 in a big, you know, UK playing to its strengths as, a, as a, an innovator. Um, but Accelerating modal shift to public and active transport is part of the uh, program. It's not just about buying electric cars. And the official statement is we need to make public transport and active travel the natural choice for daily activities. And I would argue, um, um, you know, non-daily activities such as leisure trips and staycations. Um, the carbon, um, the Climate Change Committee, um, as, as uh, set out now where transport emissions cuts must come from so that they, in their budget they've shown how um uh, what, what where we need to get to in the 2020s uh, where it will come from and 30 percent of the reduction in carbon emissions needs to come from re reduction in demand um 36 percent is from from the electrification of cars um improvement in the efficiency of petrol cars and from the electrification of vans and other, that's where rail sector is. So, um, you know, it's the road, it's road transport that's the big emitter. Uh, although we do have diesel trains and we do need to decarbonize them. It's road is the big sector where, where the majority of emissions come from. Um, and of course the policy response is, is local as well. Um, there's loads and loads of local authorities are developing uh, action plans for, for um, reducing emissions of which transport will be a chapter and um, it's it's a very widespread effort by local authorities and of course local authorities are kind of up against it now with with um, you know uh, less staff than they used to have uh, really stretched due to covid so any community um, uh, action you know that's in support of what your local authority is doing is, is a good thing um, so where, where does community rail come in um, in terms of meeting the transport decarbonisation challenge? So I've come up with this diagram, which I hope is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we obviously need to think globally and act locally. And of course, we act locally both as individual consumers and as collective members of our community. And I think that's where community rail partnership volunteering comes in. And although it's not a very happy prospect, um, we do need to have fun doing it. And um, I think that's a really important part of, of um, uh, making transport decarbonisation, you know, a part of a healthier and happier lifestyle. Um, I said I, I, I wanted to, I've only got a few slides left, so I hope I'm not running out of time too badly. Um, community rail in meeting the transport decarbonisation challenge. I said there's a particular role for, for community rail in, in leisure travel. I just wanted to share these uh, some statistics from the National Travel Survey. So this is the pre-pandemic 2019 situation. You can see that per year, on average, um, a, so the average person in England travels more about twice as far for leisure trips than they do even for commuting trips. So this is before people started working from home in vast numbers. Um, we're still doing twice the mileage for leisure purposes than for commuting purposes. That's the average person. So leisure travel is is um, a big emitter because uh, this slide shows the uh, mode, um, the miles that people do on leisure trips by mode. As you can see that um, rail is significant because um, people do long distance uh, leisure trips by rail. Uh, but um, car and van, both driver and passenger, is, is, is by far the largest uh, share of, of the distance we cover on, to, for leisure purposes every year. And we know we need to do something about that. 
Um, and I'll just also mention, because uh, that doesn't really show up in the, uh, the, the surface transport statistics, uh, we do need to um, bear in mind that flights, international flights that we take are also co contribute massively to carbon. Um, here's some uh, graphs um, that are, are produced for just uh, four districts within Leeds. Um, and, and you can see that the car and van use, um, the, the average carbon footprint from car and van use in these four different districts of Leeds um, it, it is the blue bar. And what p people use in their household from gas, electric and all space heating of their household is the gray bar. And you can see that in, in um, neighborhoods in the city center Leeds um, and, and uh, Horsforth, which is a sort of well-to-do suburb of Leeds, flights, the, the footprint from taking flights exceeds that from heating your house and far exceeds that from, from uh, uh, driving your car. So, um, so that's a kind of, a, 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 you know, a sign that the days of flying several times a year really need to end. Um, it's a pretty soft, uh, you know, it's, it's not as it's not as essential as, as heating your own house. Um, and it's very difficult to decarbonize aviation. So I think we're going to see a lot more staycations in the future. Um, right. So the, my final thing, I, I just wanted to turn to um, community rail and mode shift for leisure trips. And this is what I call it. I call this a potential example uh, that's in our own part of um, what, what, you know, part of the territory that we cover at South East Lancashire a Community Rail Partnership. So um, the left-hand map is is um, the the is a map of national parks and areas of outstanding beauty and tourist attractions in the north of England. And um, you can see Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, where most of the people live, um, and then most of the national parks are not where they live. So obviously, people travelling to a national park are going to have go quite a long way they're going to cover quite a lot of miles to uh, do it and you rack up quite a big mileage and quite a big carbon footprint doing that um, what i kind of think is an opportunity is that um, the south pennines area which on the slide is that is blank um, is actually well crisscrossed by railway lines and is quite scenic and, and it is uh, you wouldn't perhaps have your annual holiday there but if you want to have a nice walk in the countryside it's a good place to go and uh, it's close to home. It's close to seven million people live within one hour of it. Now, and there are similar examples in the southeast, southwest, and Midlands of, of England uh, as well, and Scotland. So um, this is just one example of, of what I'm talking about. Can we uh, encourage people to, um, to take some of their leisure trips closer to home and, and do it by public transport? And I just thought I'd flash that up. I don't know if anybody can tell me where that is a picture of, but I'll tell you, it's uh, that's Greater Manchester. Um, that's uh, Holcomb Hill in Bury in the foreground and Winter Hill in, in between Bolton and Blackburn in the background. And halfway between those two hills um, is um, the Bolton's Blackburn railway line. And you can access that stunning countryside by rail. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be promoting more use of, of, of car, uh, rail for that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not actually going to go through this in great detail, but I just wanted to chuck out some of the ideas that we might be talking about. So um, I've, I've literally just listed it, uh, three sort of random problems that are, are quite typical of, of what's happening, uh, leisure use in places like, um, you know, beauty spots like South Pennines, beauty spots all over the country, particularly last year in, in, in the as COVID lockdown is lifted. So popular destinations get overrun with road traffic. Uh, the, ro the constrained road access gets congested and verge parking, car parks overflow, people spoil the environment that they're going to see by, because it's overrun with cars. And, you know, I'd like to su suggest that we could perhaps do something about that and persuade people to park and ride or take a shuttle bus from a nearby station. And there are things we can do. And Paul's going to talk about the project that we've got going in Bolton. Um, I also think that people do undervalue the heritage and nature that's on literally on their doorsteps. Um, although they've now become more aware of it in the past 12 months or past 15 months. Um, and, and meanwhile, um, small independent 
hospitality businesses are struggling and really do need support. So taking your recreation and your leisure time close to home is a good thing for your for your local economy and, and your um, neighbours. Um, and the, the final thing I'll just mention is that um, public transport ought to be attractive for, for you know, for walking uh, in the countryside, particularly because you can you don't have to start and finish in the same place where you park your car. So A to B walks should be uh, a good um, public transport should be a good option for those. But we need better information and, and uh, open jaw itineraries where you go and come back from a different place. They can be over expensive. And I think we do need to do better on multimodal uh, rail ticketing and, and, and stuff that allows you to use the network as a network rather than single or expensive single and, and, and return. So we do need to do something about that. So, so those are just a few ideas um, that I just wanted to throw in. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I really look forward to participating in, in the chat and to hear what everybody here has got to say and, and, and what they're trying to get off the ground in their areas. So thank you very much. Now over to you, Jules, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks, Richard, so much for that. I thought that was that was fascinating. Um, and hi, everyone. I hope you all, you're all well there. Um, and great to see that so many of you have been able to join uh, this second webinar that we're running on on sustainability. Um, so I'm I'm going to focus in uh, now a little bit more on community engagement techniques and principles that can be used within community rail. And I hope uh, I think this will be very complementary of um the topics that uh, that richard has just been sharing um and uh hannah i believe you're going to um put my slides up it's me jules oh sorry hazel okay thank you lovely okay um so so i'm gonna as I say, focusing a bit more on community engagement techniques, and I'm, I'm going to be relating that to what research tells us about what's most likely to be effective in achieving behaviour change when we're thinking about uh, locally led initiatives. And I'm, I'm going to be drawing on community rail experience, but, but also my research backgrounds and studies that I carried out a few years ago looking at um, specifically how the community and voluntary sector can influence change on sustainability and the climate crisis. Um, so next slide, please, Hazel. Oh. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to very briefly reflect on why community rail should be focusing on modal shift, although, although I think Richard has, has already covered this um, very, very ably and, and, and hopefully you're, you're all here today because you're, you're already on board with this idea. Um, but I think it's helpful to bear in mind that we've got some particular needs and, and opportunities right now. Um, so firstly, there's that great environmental imperative, which, which Richard has talked about, and the fact that the clock is, is very much ticking if we, if we are going to succeed as we need to in keeping the earth under a 1.5 degree temperature rise. And, and as Richard has said, there's a lot that needs to be changed within transport within the current decade um, for us to for us to achieve that. On top of that, uh, as, as we're all aware, we've got this particular need post pandemic to reach out to wider audiences to attract more passengers to rail, particularly for leisure, as, as Richard has, has outlined. But the pandemic also offers us um, a really fantastic opportunity for achieving modal shift. It, it presents a great moment of change in people's lives where everything has been, been thrown up in the air. And behavioral researchers tell us that uh, this is really important, really valuable for interrupting ingrained habits. You know, life has changed. Many of us are, are working out what our new normal will look like. So this is the prime time for talking to people locally about travel habits. But modal shift, as we know, it's, it's not only good for our climate, our railways and, and recovery, it's, it's also good for our communities. Um, it helps us to reduce noise, pollution, congestion, road danger, and um, some of those particular issues that Richard's just highlighted around um, uh, popular attractions and destinations. 
It helps to make our communities healthier, more pleasant places and more inclusive places too. Um, less car orientated communities are more equitable and simply nicer places for everyone to, to be. And I think it's those local benefits that we, we can really tap into and that are all, often the, the, the most powerful arguments that, that will resonate with people and which we can, we can make use of in our uh, communications and our, our messaging around modal shift. But I think the other very good reason for Community Rail encouraging modal shift is that we're so well placed uh, to make it happen. You know, given the, the nature of Community Rail as a grassroots community based movement, uh, and I'll come back to that point. Uh, next slide, please, Hazel. Um, so, uh, a look at uh, what the evidence uh, indicates um, uh, in, in terms of. Uh, what's most likely to work um, to achieve modal shift through local engagement. And, um, and I'm gonna scoot across um, uh, some, some findings across a, a number of different research disciplines. Um, this is a, um, a summary of a fairly recent uh, assessment of evidence on modal shift by the um, NatSEN Center for Social Research. Um, and it found that um, interventions are, are most likely to be effective if they encourage people to reflect on their behaviour in regards to social norms. So thinking about what, what's the normal and natural way to get around. Interventions are most likely to be effective if they focus on working with people uh, in relation to simpler journeys that are easier to switch. Um, and specifically where initiatives enable people to try out that mode first and see if it works for them. They found that it also helps if we hold up positive examples of other people who have made the switch. Um, so helping to, to, to show that it, you know, that it can be done, that it can work on a day-to-day on a -day basis and helping to, to normalize um, more sustainable modes of, of, of transport. Um, and, and the report emphasized too that the practicalities are, are crucial. Uh, sustainable modes have got to be convenient, cost-effective, well-integrated and visible uh, alongside working with local people engaging and, and communicating uh, these, these important messages. So I think that there are some key takeaways there for Community Rail, um, uh, including underlining good practice that's already going on uh, that fits with these findings, like try the train trips and, and promotions showing that the railway is a, a positive and, and, and um, normal um, valued part of community life. Next slide, please, Hazel. Um, there are a lot of relevant insights too for Community Rail in, in wider research on sustainability and behaviour change. Um, so a lot of behavioural research echoes this idea that the practicalities matter. So we can't just tell people or, or ask people to do things differently. Uh, instead, we need to listen to people. We need to understand the barriers or concerns that they face and we need to work with them to break those down. Especially, as, as many researchers tell us, um, across social psychology, um, political economy, um, research, a lot of researchers say that it, when it comes to making change, feelings matter uh, and identities matter, um, and especially creating a sense of belonging and efficacy. So if we can help people to feel a part of something and like they can make a, a real difference through their actions, they're more likely to act and more likely to act together. Of course, if people feel that their, their actions are not going to have uh, the desired effect, they're, they're less likely to, to, to do that action to make the change. We can also look at research on the climate crisis. Um, and a lot of um, uh, academics have looked into why so little change has, has happened so far in terms of people's behaviors. Uh, and many experts say that it's, it, it is because it, it, as Richard alluded to, it's such a scary, complex, global problem. It, it can cause people to shy away or to, to shrug their shoulders and say, well, what difference can I make? So it creates by its nature a feeling of hopelessness and it can impinge on our sense of identity by suggesting that our lifestyles are, are in some way wrong or, or irresponsible. And that, that, of course, is an uncomfortable idea for people. So all of this suggests that if we want to enable more sustainable transport behaviours, 
We need to work together locally. We need to make these issues relevant and meaningful at a local level and in, in an everyday way. And, it, and in a way that makes people feel good and, and hopeful and empowered. Next slide, please. And in fact, oh, I don't know what's happened with that slide. Oh, oh, a bit of drama there. <laughs> um, so in fact, many, many researchers say it's, it's community level and community led action where our best hope lies um, for bringing about more sustainable behaviours and development. And that this paper that's, that's quoted here um, essentially says it's, it's at community level where we can best innovate and best achieve change on sustainability. And when aggregated across lots of different localities, that's where we're going to have maximum overall effect. And these researchers specifically point to the vitality of our communities as being important. So the connections between people, um, the ability of people to work together locally and, and, and make a difference. This is all important to um, sustainable development. Next slide, please. So to, to sum up what, what I take from research on, on how we can achieve more sustainable behaviours and modal shift through, through local engagement, we need to be realistic, first of all, that we can't just persuade people. Um, and, and actually, it can be counterproductive if we are seen as telling people what to do or, or undermining people's existing lifestyles, people's uh, sense of identity. We need to bear in mind that the private car is deeply embedded in people's lifestyles, their identities, in our communities, um, following decades of car orientated development. And, and cultural discourses that associate the car with, with, with success and, and freedom. Um, we, we need to bear in mind that transport mode is not generally a matter of free, um, unconstrained, conscious choice. Uh, the practicalities are important too, and working with people to address both perceived and practical barriers is, is important. I think this means we, we will do well to think of modal shift as, as a recruitment exercise. It's about bringing people on board, um, not telling them, not finger wagging, not, not telling them off, not telling them what to do. Um, and particularly, we should think about it as a social recruitment exercise. So helping people to make change together and to feel empowered and feel feel good as a, as a result and and i definitely agree with richard about having having fun um i, I think it is probably an overlooked um uh, part of the the solution to this challenge so we need to position not only position rail and sustainable modes as positive but show the benefits that they offer to to keep to individuals and to their communities and show that these modes show that our railways are part of our communities and, and create a sense of momentum and efficacy moving towards um, a better, more sustainable transport future together. And we need to show too that we and our railway partners and other transport partners uh, uh, are engaging with local people and listening to them and responding to their, their views and ideas. It's really important. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and that slide's done that again. Sorry, I'm, I must have done something strange with my slides. <laughs> um, and, and as I've said, we also really need to normalise sustainable transport behaviours build familiarity and build relationships. And I, and I really like this quote from the Friends of Glossop Station, which suggests uh, quite rightly, I think, that this is what Community Rail does best. So I, I, I think that sums it up extremely well. Um, next slide, please, Hazel. Okay, so uh, I hope you can read that um, rather tiny text. Um, I've, I've tried to um, sum this up as a set of broad principles um, that Community Rail can adopt in approaching um, modal shift. And I know many of you will be following um, uh, at least some of this already. And, and I think a lot of this comes very naturally given the Community Rail ethos, but, but hopefully this is a, a useful tick list. Uh, and top of my list is, is to really take care that we're not falling into that pattern or that, that trap of normalising private car use. And instead, 
promoting the alternatives in combination, rail, bus, walking, cycling, community transport, promoting all of that as a natural way to get around. And it's good to see DFT and, and, and the rail industry starting to use this kind of language too. And I think we can um, link in with that. So we need to remember that social norms are important in guiding behaviours. Um, and it's why, of course, it's, it, it can be so frustrating when you, when you arrive somewhere and it's assumed that you've driven or, or when accommodation or attractions give only give you the driving directions or they put that at the top of their list. And we need to start to just turn that around and reset those priorities. Being positive, having fun, as we've said, showing the benefits of rail, something that Community Rail does very well already. Um, and I think there's increasingly this good work showing uh, good, good work going on in community rail, um, showing that rail is is a, is a cornerstone of, of that wider sustainable transport network that that we we need to aspire to in the future. Um, enabling social interaction, making people feel feel part of something, such as using creative projects, um, drawing on our localities as a, as a resource. Um, sharing local histories and stories um, uh, and, and, and bringing people together with the railway as a focal point. Um, listening to people, showing that we're listening, um, especially to break down barriers. Um, and across all we do, building a sense of efficacy and pride and really showing that we're, we're empowering local people through our work and giving local people a chance to, to make a positive difference themselves and turn their ideas into, into reality. This is all uh, powerful stuff when it comes to modal shift. Next slide, please, Hazel. There we go. <laughs> so there's a, there's a wide variety of, of engagement techniques that are already being used um, across community rail that fit with those principles in which we've been working to, to share and encourage uh, across different areas. Um, but also we continue to see innovation and new approaches, um, particularly as community rail has um, been increasingly working with a broader variety of local partners and groups. And I think that's, that's a really important aspect to how we can continue to um, drive this area of work forward. But some of the tried and tested engagement initiatives that, that fit with those principles include, of course, try the train trips, workshops, station visits, anything that, that gets people using the train, increasing familiarity, increasing confidence, gets people thinking, I can do this, it's convenient, I like it, or, or better, we like it. Um, creative projects, community gardening, social events at stations, these are all activities that bring people together and create a sense that the railway is part of the community. Storytelling, creative writing projects, drawing on local views and knowledge, um, shared visioning events and other discussion based events that enable people to develop shared goals and, can, and, and, and to consider how the community can benefit as much as possible from the railway. Uh, again, this is empowering, which fits with what research tells us. Youth-led initiatives, confidence programmes, of course, engaging with young people is key to modal shift because we're, we're involving them at a point in life where mobility habits and horizons are still forming. And participatory mapping. Um, many of you attended the training sessions that we ran on this particular technique last year. And if not, it's something that our team and our partners at Mapping for Change are happy to um, help you with. So many of these initiatives are, are already happening in community rail and hopefully will be ramping up further over the over the coming months. Um, but I think it, we don't always see them as being specifically about modal shift. Um, they all fit really well with the research insights and perhaps we can benefit from giving greater attention to how these projects do impact on transport behaviours and, and the modal shift outcomes that we, we are delivering through this work. And I think perhaps there's, there's more we can make of this type of work through our communications. So drawing on these engagement projects to produce um, communications that go out to wider audiences, taking the, the stories and ideas that people contribute through engagement, images and artwork and making use of those through social media, PR activity, our materials, etc. I think it's also important that we, we close that feedback loop and we tell people um, we, we, we take what people are telling us through these initiatives, 
We use that to shape our plans, to advise industry and local authority partners to help to break down those barriers to do with integration and accessibility and um, costs and ticketing, perhaps providing that voice for the local communities, but then feeding that back to the community, um, get creating that sense of, of e efficacy and what we can, uh, what we've changed together. Next slide, please. So a few very quick examples for you of community rail projects that align with research on modal shift. And, and these are examples we've shared before. They're on our website, so you can find more detail. Um, Time Valley's um, Lyric and Lime project uh, uh, was covered at our conference back in March. It's a great example of working creatively with, with different groups of people in the community, bringing them together in an empowering way and using a creative approach to explore and break down barriers to sustainable transport. Devon and Cornwall's Carbon Reduction Challenge is another brilliant project that, that worked with primary schools to not only raise awareness about the carbon savings of rail, but create a sense that each family could make a difference and that their combined efforts were powerful. So th thinking about that idea of recruiting people socially, it's a great example. Next slide, please. A recent example on the Abbey Line, um, where supportive, welcoming signage at stations has been combined with um, biodiversity friendly planting, working in partnership with a local MENCAP group. And, and this is a, a great example of showing that stations are part of the community, creating pride and ownership, and then pushing the, the, those messages out to wider audiences using social media. And lastly, Kent CRP's long running um, partnership working with Sheppey College, which has delivered a, a great deal of success in getting young people feeling confident and enthusiastic about rail, like it's a natural part of their, their future. Uh, and there's much more information on that project in our youth engagement report um, on our website. Next slide, please. So I hope I've provided um, some useful food for thought on how different community engagement can be used to achieve modal shift and how that, how, how that fits with research um, and how we can maximize benefit from these initiatives through good local uh, accompanying communications and by feeding in local ideas um, to, through our partners on, on rail and, and transport development. And I, I knew I wouldn't have time to, to talk through this slide, but I've, I've left it in for you to refer back to, as I hope it's a useful summary of some of the ways Community Rail might further develop its approach um, and extend its reach, both thinking about what we do and, and the content and, and messaging that we use. Last slide, please. So I'm just going to finish by giving a plug to a number of our key resources that have got relevant uh, advice and insights on this and related topics. Firstly, we've got a new report um, coming out next week on the topic of modal shift, which goes into more detail on lo a lot of the points that I've, I've been making. Um, We've also got a report already available on our website on using communications to best effect um, to promote community rail and sustainable transport um, and thinking about messaging and, and content uh, specifically. Last year's report on youth engagement is, is re very relevant to the, this topic, as I've said, and also our, our toolkit on community led modal integration work um, uh, is, is, is linked from this slide. And of course, do speak to our team. For advice um, and bear in mind the wide variety of partners that we're now working with who we can refer you to including involved in, 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 in uh, the bus sector, community transport, uh, walking and cycling as we've said that that joined up working across modes is, is, is absolutely key. Um, so I will stop there, thank you uh, very much for, for listening and um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts and queries um, in the discussion um, and we'll hand back to Sarah. Thank you, Jules, and thank you, Richard, too. Um, two really interesting presentations. And I think some of the facts that really stuck out for me, Richard, was and resonated with it. It's, it's going to be the coolest summer for the rest of the century, and that's really, really startling uh, to hear. Um, and I think the photo you flashed up from February 19 was very close to where I live. Um, and I, I live on um, the moors in the, in the Pennines, and I think those moorland fires are becoming ever so frequent now. 
um, Sadler, some great examples from yourself, Jules, around the work we're already doing at Community Rail and how we can build on that to get that greater sense of belonging, to get that behaviour change um, and the critical role I think Community Rail can play on, on, on almost on the global stage, really, in terms of making a difference going forward. Um, now, you've not let me down in the chat, so I am very relieved. Um, so I, I've not got to fill in for too long, so that was good. Um, so I'm just going to, um, we've got a number of questions already. So I'm going to come to uh, David Bamford, um, who's got a question around the role of community, the role of community rail going in this debate. So David, over to you to ask your question. Is that all right? Hi, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, thanks for putting on. It's, as, as you just said, Sarah, it's all really interesting. Um, both speakers really, really interesting. Um, but how can Community Rail have a greater focus on door to door journeys? So kind of the bit beyond uh, the railway. So whether that's getting from the house uh, to the station or whether that's getting from uh, the station to, you know, where people are going. So whether that's tourist attractions or, you know, even for walks and stuff, how how do you think Community Rail does engage to kind of improve that and therefore get more people using the railways? Richard, do you want to start off with that one? Yeah, happy to have a go at that. Yeah, um, yes, good, great question, David. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the only thing I could say is that there's the journey to the station from, from your home, and then there's a journey from your destination station to where you're going. <clears throat> and I think the rail industry used to be terrible at car parking, but over the last 30 years has got 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 it about car parking particularly where they can make money out of it so um but obviously people you, you want to have a, a good uh, blend of facilities for people to access the railway station from where they live and that car parking is part of that mix but i think where we can do a lot better is um the onward journey from the station when obviously you don't have your vehicle with you um you know, not every trip is is, is a, a, something you can walk to or indeed afford to get a taxi to from the station. And I, I think, um, uh, you know, traditionally the rail industry is not has tended to feel that once you're at the station door, you, you know, the customers, <laughs> it's up to them what they do next. But I think there are some commercial opportunities and community rail opportunities with, with this, um, you know, for example, um, you know, interesting modes like electric, shared electric bikes or shared scooters to, to uh, you know, station forecourts, so a, a natural environment where you could try and put those kind of things, um, higher bikes. And I think where, you know, some of that's commercial, where the usage levels are too low for it to be strictly commercial, where the community rail can play a part in, um, um, you know, it might even just be information about where those facilities are. So if you walk to the village, you'll find a cycle shop where you can hire a cycle or something like that. You know, that's the kind of level that we could contribute. But you, you, you're dead right. We need to um, focus on it. And I think we need to, uh, community rail movement needs to kind of nudge the rail industry to, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of the job that we can both do. Thanks, Richard. Jules, do you want to come in? Or yeah, I was, uh, yeah, yeah, just I guess complementing that. Uh, I, I think uh, understanding what the barriers are at the moment, as, as I emphasised in, in my presentation, both both for local residents travelling out, um, and as Richard said, also thinking about visitors coming in, um, and making sure that we're in in seeking to understand the barriers to integrated, sustainable end to end journeys. Um, making sure that we are engaging with people, of course, who are not using the railways at the moment um, and thinking about what, what would need to change to enable them to, to use rail in combination with ideally active travel, buses, community transport. So talking to people in the local area about the barriers, about what, what could change um, to make it easier um, to open up these opportunities, but also talking to people coming into your area, I think is is key and I, I referenced as well um, very briefly at the end our um, toolkit that we've got available on our website on community-led station travel planning which is all about community-led approaches to modal integration uh, it's packed with with useful advice and examples um, 
And I mentioned too that we're also working with a number of partners who are focused on, on particular aspects of that. Um, Como UK, for example, they, they um, are very interested in creating mobility hubs. Um, so stations that genuinely do work as um, multimodal interchanges and, and, and priority, you know, thinking about the modal hierarchy as well is important. So uh, as much as possible, um, enabling journeys to be made through walking or cycling, or at least partially so, then thinking about public transport, um, community transport and shared mobility and, and really kind of putting private car use at, at the bottom of the pile is, I think, important to, to, to achieving a change in all of this. Thanks, Jules. I'm conscious we've got a number of questions. So I'm going to go to our next one, which is from Andy Buckley, which is around electrification. Andy, is that all right? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wondered if um, the panel was surprised as we were. In fact, I'd like to substitute surprise for dismay. Um, when we took part in the East West Rail consultation, uh, this is the proposal to uh, bring back the railway between Oxford and Cambridge, but uh, there was no provision for electrification from day one. Um, they're saying that they'll build the railway to electric standards, but um, they seem to be thinking that the, by the time the railway comes along, we'll be using hydrogen powered trains and um, there won't be any need for electrification anyway. But this, this sounds a bit silly to me. <laughs> I just wonder whether you had a view on this. Paul, Bring in mind, to... it's a, a 21st century railway and, and <laughs> electrification is not being considered. Thanks, Andy. Could I, Jules, did you want to come in there? Well, so... I was just gonna, yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing I can kind of say specifically about why why that decision has been made. But um, I, I mean, obviously, it does it does make it it can feel like it's it's harder to engage people um, locally on uh, in relation to rail being a sustainable transport option when we, we obviously do have work to do to um, to further electrify the network and, and make the network as green as it can be. Um, but I think the you know the arguments still absolutely stand about shifting journeys, um, even onto parts of the network that haven't been electrified. It's still it's still far greener for people to be travelling by rail than than everyone going around in a private car. So, um, and and I think you know I, I emphasise this this in my presentation where where we are achieving. Um, progress where where we are feeding through views and, and ideas and, and 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 that is being picked up by the industry. I think you know showing that that's happening is um, uh, is a powerful thing. So um, so where there is progress being made, um, you know, and the fact that the railway is being expanded and developed, I think is a is a, is a positive um, message. Nevertheless, thanks. Yeah, can I? Uh, I just want to say, yeah, I gave about a year of my life to East West Rail in the noughties. Um, so it, it, my day job is in the Department for Transport. <clears throat> and I, I used to work on the uh, Southeast Plan. And um, it was going to be electrified when I was working on it. It was going to be part of something called the Electric Spine, which was going to go from Southampton to um, uh, beyond Sheffield. And, and you get the electrification between... Oxford and um, Milton Keynes uh, as part of that. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, some electrification schemes went massively over budget, Great Western and uh, North Western uh, Triangle, the Manchester, Liverpool, Preston. Um, and I think fingers were burnt a bit, but uh, let's see what happens next. Might not be a final uh, position, Andy. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for the question, Andy. Um, over to David Stubbins, who's got a couple of questions around local authorities and buses. Is that is that right, David? Are you there? Oh, yeah, here. Thanks, Dave. Over to you. Hi, 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 everybody. Yeah, I'm Dave Stubbins. Um, I'm a station adopter at, at Carp Station, which uh, is just outside the Lake District National Park. Now, my question is that obviously. In Cumbria, our local authority budgets have been constrained like so many others, and an easy uh, win for them is just to eliminate public transport, which is what's happened. We've got the railway running round the edge of the Lake District, providing quite a reasonable service, and into Windermere, but there's virtually no public transport um, inside that. 
And there must be people who, if there were buses, would use them. And I wonder whether there's, if central government are committed to, um, you know, public, uh, the, the elimination of car journeys, whether they could provide funding to local authorities specifically for, uh, specifically for, um, you know, public transport. Jules, do you want to come in on that one? <laughs> oh, just a very. I, I appreciate there are so, there are some parts hey, of where, where it's um it's yeah. It's John, can I read that? I, mean, I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I appreciate there's some parts of the country where it's it's particularly it's particularly challenging because because of the the scarcity of of public transport, and I think Catherine's made a, a, a asked it asked a question. Similarly, um, re reflecting that that point, um, uh, and I think it, as I as I said earlier, um, you know, it's it's not just about promoting uh, sustainable transport. We we do need to work to overcome these these uh, very real practical hurdles as well. Um, and I think where where we can work with local communities and, and and partner with local authorities to make practical improvements, and then reflecting back to the community that that is um, uh, a response to to their needs and their wishes and part of a part of this this uh, progress towards a more sustainable transport future. I, I think that's a very powerful powerful thing but I, I do appreciate it. it's very challenging I, th I think there are some particular opportunities though um, at the moment um, following on from the government's um, new bus strategy um, which we, we um, put a couple of briefings in in our um, bulletin um, uh, a few months ago about that suggesting different ways that community rail can work with local authorities to support the development of bus um, bus service improvement plans um, uh, and, and and potentially feed in on on integration between between bus and rail um, so perhaps we'll, we'll share some of those those briefings um, uh, again um, but but I think definitely worth talking to local authorities specifically in light of the, the new bus strategy and, and the, the, the requirements that are being placed on them in relation to that. Thanks, Jules. Yeah. Richard. Uh, yeah, I'll just add a couple of things to what Jules has said there. Um, I, I mean, I, the, the key thing is that the, the, I think the government's recognised that, um, that the, the quest for savings, uh, which meant so many cuts to um, um, supported bus services it went too far and the, this bus back better strategy it does promise to turn the corner uh, you need to keep an eye on the money involved but j just to sort of um, just to mention a couple of things really I mean firstly uh, the conventional bus service you know there are options um, around using sort of apps and 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 uh, the kind of the fact we're all connected by mobile phone these days, there might be options to provide uh, more flexible transport that's cheaper than a taxi, but is, is, is more on demand than a bus and get the pricing of that right and the subsidy level of that right. So, you know, we should be alive to those possibilities. Um, but I, I, I also think that community rail, I mean, we're really, for, for my view, it, you know, a community rail partnership is about the community and the access by bus is just as important as the access by rail. And so I, I, any moves by community rail to be about, you know, community public transport network, if you like, um, I think is, is, is really good. Um, and, and um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think. But, uh, yeah, I just want to know what John thinks. Um, and Dave, who phoned you up? <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. We have got a couple more questions, which we'll try and bring in. I know, I know Catherine Huddleston and Helen Wright, you've got a couple of questions, which, but I'm conscious of the time. So what we might try and do is weave those in, in at the end, if that's all right, because I'm, I'm being told by Hazel, I need to get you to your toilet breaks and, and quick drinks. Um, so if we just have a quick 10 minute break, um, I know we've had in a little bit into that time. Um, so if we're back here for 20 past, if that'd be OK with everybody. Is that all right, Hazel, with everything? Um so 
So welcome back, everyone. Um, sorry, that was a shorter break, but it's really encouraging. We've had so many questions and there's quite a lot, a few more in the chat, which hopefully we'll come to at the end. So we may run over a little bit to, to make sure we get those questions answered. So, so thank you for your enthusiasm, everybody. Uh, so now it's over to our final discussion se uh, session. Um, and I think in many ways, this man needs no introduction. Um, so it's uh, now over to, to Paul Salveston, who's, who's going to talk to us for the, for the final session. So over to you, Paul. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, I, I'm like you, I'm a bit of a technophobe and I, I do like actually speaking to people and people seeing me speaking. So I'm not going to do uh, a PowerPoint presentation as such, but there are some images which I'll pass over to, to Hazel to, to share with you when, when we get to those. But for the most of the time, you, you'll have to listen to me, I'm afraid. And I'll just have a quick slurp of coffee. So I'm speaking as the, the, the chair of the South East Lanx Community Rail Partnership, which, which Richard uh, has already mentioned. Richard's actually our, our treasurer. Uh, and so he's been very much involved in, in this project in, in handling the money. So the South East Lanx Community Rail Partnership, we're, we're one of the newer CRPs. We were set up um, formally in November 2019. We were accredited last year. And I'm just pleased to say that just the other day we, we got the OK for reaccreditation. And we've grown quite significantly in, in all sorts of different ways. We've grown geographically from being very much based in Bolton to widening our scope to cover Manchester, out to Preston, black, towards Blackburn and also Wigan. And we've also been able to recruit a full-time member of staff, uh, Steph, who started in June last year, probably not the most auspicious time to, to start, you know, coming from a quite different background in, in community development. But we've been doing lots of uh, really quite groundbreaking work, particularly, I would say, around hate crime, uh, but also encouraging access to the surrounding countryside. Because although we cover a heavily populated area, I think this is a key thing for what I'm going to be saying, uh, there are some very attractive uh, stretches of countryside on the edges of Greater Manchester and Lancashire that come within our area. And so what we uh, were particularly concerned about that led to this project was uh, the situation in Rivington. It's a very, very popular country park. It was gifted by Lord Levy back in 1904 to the people of Bolton. But it actually straddles two boundaries, which is one of the interesting issues. Uh, we're right on the edge of Greater Manchester. Rivington itself is actually in Lancashire by about half a mile. Oh, and yet within... Oh. Sorry? sorry? Really sorry to interrupt you. Can mm -hmm. you please tilt your camera because you keep going right down off camera. Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, thank it, you. it's tilting back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's with you moving as well. Sorry. Yeah. To... I hope you like my prop, by the way. That's better. <laughs> I've been waiting for ages for a bus to come and nothing's appeared. Yeah, so uh we cover a very, very large population area, probably within a 15 mile radius of Rivington. Uh, there's about 3 million people living. So, uh, and yet the irony of this uh, very attractive country park, which gets about half a million visitors a year, is that there's no public transport. The, the nearest railway station is about three miles away. Uh, the nearest bus route is about probably a two mile walk, I would say, to the heart of the, the country park. So as a CRP, we thought, well, there's real potential here. And we were, I suppose, encouraged by the, the, the existence of CRN's Inter Integrated Sustainable Transport Fund. We thought, well, what, what can we do? Uh, where is that within our area that needs uh, better connectivity with the rail network? And so, out of that, we started, we put our thinking caps on and looked at different options, including a dedicated bus service from, from Bolton or from Horwich Parkway Station. Um, that, that was one option, uh, but we talked to the, the main local operator, which is Diamond Buses Northwest, owned by Rotala, uh, which uh, fairly recently took over all first bus 
operations in Bolton. So it went from being a very small player uh, in our area to the, if you like, the predominant operator and said, well, you know, we're, we're looking at ways of serving Rivington. What do you think? Could you provide uh, a bespoke service? And they came up with the idea of extending an existing service, which already operates between Bolton and Horwich on Sundays every half hour. And they said, well, you know, if there was some funding available, uh, we could extend it to basically do a, a circuit around Rivington Park, Country Park on a half hourly basis throughout the day on a Sunday. And that was the option that we went for. And there are pros and cons to that. And I'll, I'll come back onto it in a moment. But it's probably a, a good point at which to have a look at the, the, the first slide, if, if Hazel could get that up, please. Yeah, so this uh, artwork was actually done by the bus operator. And I think it, it shows the, uh, if you like, the, the, the hands-on approach and the engagement that, that they've had. They haven't just provided the service. They produce this quite attractive poster, which will be going up um, in, in different parts of Greater Manchester. Um, if we could perhaps focus in on the map now, please, so I can give you a, a, a better idea of the geography. Yeah, thanks, Hazel. So you've got Bolton Town Centre at the far right of the picture, and then the existing route of the 575, which uh, goes along Chorley New Road, which will be well known to anybody in the Bolton area, but quite, a, if you like, a, a leafy suburb and uh, takes you in to the centre of Horwich and then does a circuit normally around what we call Old Lloyd's Estate. It's a, a large housing estate. Now the new bit continues on from there, doing that circuit, a one-way loop through the heart of Rivington Country Park, which is, if you like, slightly to the right of the, the reservoir, Lower Rivington Reservoir, and then back down over the causeway, I'll come back to that in a moment, and then back into Horwich and then reassumes the, its existing route. So it's an extension of an existing service, uh, obviously registered by the Traffic Commissioner, run as a commercial operation on, on a Sunday, so we didn't have to get, get too bogged down with, uh, with all that. We, we've just Basically, we agreed uh, an outline payment to the operator to extend the service and they registered the additional three miles or so with, with the traffic commissioners. So they took all that bureaucracy away from us and perhaps should show you a couple more pictures uh, while we're, we're on the screen. Sorry, Paul, bear with me one second. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, sorry, clearing off a PDF isn't no. always the easiest thing to do. So, yeah. We'll, we'll just run through all the pictures. So, there we go. Yeah, and there we are. That was our first passenger, <laughs> the, the Mayor of Horwich. We've worked very closely with Horwich Town Council on this project. They've been very, very keen to uh, get a public transport link into Rivington for many years it's not had a bus service for at least 30 years we think and it now has huge traffic problems which I'll, I'll keep coming back to so we did a special trip actually for town council members again provided by the bus operator uh, through their own goodwill and there's Gordon uh, the former mayor he, he stood down in May joining us okay next one please And uh, that's uh, the, the same outing when up, went up to um, Rivington, the, the upper barn, which isn't on the normal route, but we thought we'd uh, go up there anyway and have a look round. And you can see the, uh, the, the signage there that the bus operator produced. We're taking you to Rivington on 0575, um, which again was uh, done off their own bat. Next one, please. There it is again. The, the people at Rivington uh, Barn were rather surprised to see a bus turning up in space. It's normally used for when they have a, 
wedding events and uh, once we reassured them we were only stopping for a minute they were very very pleased to have us there because they were saying that we, we really need a, a bus service to take people uh, to to our place and, and elsewhere in the park okay next one i think it's the last one yeah uh, the the driver i think uh, having good friendly and welcoming staff is so important which is the point I'll, I'll come back to uh there is a huddersfield connection actually with this the the, the young lad here i think steve um did his uh, transport and logistics degree at the university of huddersfield so i forgot to just mention that you know to show that we uh, you know we're, we're very liberal and opening in welcoming yorkshire people in lancashire Okay, and I think we can go back to me now, I'm afraid. Yeah, we'll be back. Yeah, you're back, Paul. Okay, thanks. I can just see a, a C. But anyway, as long as you can see me, that's the main thing and, and hear me. So the issues that we're trying to address was, on the one hand, the fact that people, if you didn't have access to a car, you couldn't get to this very attractive and, and nearby <clears throat> place. If you did have a car, more and more people were finding it a bit of a nightmare at weekends, particularly to uh, access the place and to park up. And the whole feel of the place was being spoilt if you by this sort of being absolutely deluged by car traffic. This was even during the pandemic and particularly uh, th this year, more and more people started thinking, well, it's OK to um, come back and uh, visit the outdoors, which was fair enough. But with that came this huge traffic problem. Trying to encourage people back onto the bus, as, as Brian Barnsley and myself know very well from a, an earlier CRP project when the Penniston Line Partnership initiated the, the Holmforth branch line as a community bus operation. It takes a long, long time. You really have to uh, work very, very hard to, to build the awareness. And this is where having a, a supportive operator comes in, but also partnering up with the uh, Horwich Town Council, other local agencies. I think, uh, and I'll come on to some of the uh, lessons from the experience so far to, towards the end of this talk but it does take time anybody who thinks that you can start a new bus service when there hasn't been one for decades and think uh, suddenly uh, that all the seats will be filled uh, is in for a rude awakening it does take time and we're slowly getting there we had 40 people traveling over there on the uh, bank holiday monday and again just to remind you the service only operates on sundays and, and bank holidays at the moment but um, it, it's a so it's a slow process and uh, and I was talking to uh, Brian Barnsley the other day and he made the point that they, this, these things take years rather than months to bed in and we've only got till October to really make some sort of success of this service so trying to get people out of the cars it's Really, to be honest, it's not driven by appealing to people's um, higher moral nature that this is all about combating climate change. It's saying it's actually much easier to get to Rivington on the bus. You don't have to worry about finding somewhere to park. At the moment, parking is free, which I think is uh, unhelpful. United Utilities that actually own the, the country park now because it's former water board land they are looking at bringing in parking charges which makes sense particularly if that can go into funding a continuation of the the public transport service and also it, it creates more of a level playing field if you know that you can drive to Rivington and you can park and it's free if you've got access to a car the likelihood is that you'll do that if you think well you know, parking's a bit of a pain, you've got to pay for it as well, and there's a bus that you're aware of that runs every half hour, you, you might be inclined to use the bus. And uh, obviously it's all part of a much bigger agenda to encourage people to undertake a modal shift for all sorts of reasons, not least combating climate change. If we're actually going to influence people and get them to change, 
I think it's got to be very, very practical and an element of, of carrot and stick, if you like. Other things, so I've, I think I've already uh, mentioned and stressed the, the importance of having a supportive operator on board. Also the point about promotion, it's got to be absolutely relentless. I think as a CRP, we've got quite good in, in the last year, very much thanks to, to Steph really, our new officer. Uh, in terms of developing a Facebook presence, using Twitter, Instagram, really getting the message out on a weekly basis so that they, it, it beds in that there is a bus that people can use. And of course, the best publicity is actually being in Rivington, struggling to find somewhere to park and you see a bus sailing past and that actually encourages people to use it. And uh, I think it's a point that, that Jules made in her contribution that if you can get people using public transport maybe for leisure purposes um having a, a nice day out to rivington on the bus everything goes smoothly i think well yeah maybe i could use the bus or the train for other things as well and speaking of trains we're a community rail partnership what why are we getting involved in this and part of it is that and i think it's one of the strengths of crps that we can work with local authorities, we can work with bus operators, we can work with train operators, transport for Greater Manchester, Lancashire County Council. So we're very much part of that wider network. And uh, it does mean that we've got the right contacts to, to make these sort of things happen. Which, uh, you know, if United Utilities or Horwich Town Council or whoever had tried to do it, they might, might have struggled actually in finding the right people to talk to. So the role of the CRP is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, we've, um, because it's a commercial service, we've not had to uh, engage in detail with Transport for Greater Manchester. They've been very helpful and supportive, mainly through the rail team, because they see it as a way of getting people out from other parts of Greater Manchester, as do, do we, from Manchester itself, Salford, Wigan, and other areas, so you can get the train into Bolton and then get a half hourly bus service. And uh, th the main thing they did was to, to give us these temporary bus signs, which we did a bit of guerrilla bus stop sign erection around Rivington, to, again, to raise awareness that the, the bus does run. Uh, it's actually hail and ride, so you can get on it or off it anywhere where it's safe to do it. Other things to say, uh, looking to the future and the lessons, um, get the right operator on board, share ideas and information with them, um, make sure the timetable is robust. I think we probably heard too much on the side of it being slack, so there's a bit too much time spent hanging around at a couple of locations, which, which makes it feel, a, a, well, it, it gets a bit boring being being stuck at Old Lord's housing estate for, for 10 minutes before setting off. But you do need to allow for potential traffic congestion on part of the route, which hasn't been as bad as we, we, we thought it might have been. Other things to say, um, and again, this is where anybody watching this thinking about doing the same thing, having a bespoke service is, is all very good if you can support it. Um, we, we've got the funding to do this till the end of October. Hopefully, if it does start to really generate significant ridership, we might be able to persuade the operator to run it all year round. Our ideal would be to do it seven days a week all year round. That way you really create the awareness that the bus service is there. Um, and so we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that one. But the advantages of a bespoke service is that you, you can really go to town in terms of promoting it. You can have a particular vehicle, uh, specially branded. You can have dedicated drivers. So there's arguments for and against. And what I'm just going to finish with a direct result of the, the Rivington bus was uh, being contacted by a councillor from Wigan, the neighbouring local authority to, to Bolton, uh, who'd been told about the, uh, the Rivington bus by friends in TFGM. So it's all about networks. And he said, well, 
we're really interested in getting a bus link to Hague Country Park, which is based on Hague Hall. Again, another very, very big uh, visitor attraction in the Northwest with our